Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patrick Madden, the Executive Director of the National Archives Foundation. I want to welcome you to the National Archives. We're pleased to have you for this special evening with Cokie Roberts and Michael Beschloss. The Foundation is the private partner to the National Archives for all things serious and fun. And tonight, I think you'll get a little bit of both. And if you haven't been upstairs during regular business hours, the Spirited Republic exhibition is a little bit of fun and a little bit of serious, with nearly 100 National Archives records that examines the production, consumption, and regulation of alcohol through US history. These are just two examples of initiatives that the Foundation supports, including educational outreach programs, uh, public programs, online resources, family days, sleepovers in the rotunda, capital projects, and so much more. <coughs> We help the archives with their mission to make the records more accessible. I know we have a number of foundation members in the audience tonight and joining us online. Thank you. The foundation raises support through corporations and foundations and folks like you. And in fact, uh, we know those who are passionate about uh, history and civic literacy are passionate about the foundation. Uh, last year, we had donors from 47 states and the District of Columbia. I won't guilt those three states. OK, if you insist, uh, it was North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming. So if you're watching at home online, I encourage you to go online and join. I personally will send you a special gift from the archive store. We'd love to get those three states on board. If you're here tonight and you're not a member yet, you can uh, visit archivesfoundation.org and sign up and join, uh, enjoy the benefits of membership. Uh, and if you are a member, thank you again, but you don't have to stop with your membership. You can visit the archive store upstairs or online at myarchivestore.org. And I'm sure right now, those of you who are here, you can go online and before Koki has even come out, you can purchase something to support <laughs> the National Archives and the Foundation. So with all those public service announcements complete, I now give you our host who will offer the official archives welcome, our partner of the 10th Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero. Thank you, Patrick, and thank you um, to the Foundation for all the work that you do to support our education, outreach, and exhibit programs. Good evening to all of you here in the William G. McGowan Theater, and a special welcome to those of you who are joining us on our YouTube channel. Welcome to the National Archives. Tonight, we take a look at the contributions of the women of Washington in the years leading up to the Civil War, during the war, and in the few years after the guns fell silent 150 years ago. In her new book, Capital Dames, Cokie Roberts examines the contributions that these formidable women had in holding the union together. At the same time, these women were changing the place of women in our society, as Cokie will explain in a few moments. Before we move on to tonight's program, I'd like to tell you about two other programs coming up soon here in the McGowan Theater. On Thursday, May 7th at 7 p.m., Jonathan D. Sarna will discuss his new book, Lincoln and the Jews, A History which tells the full story of Lincoln's extraordinary relationship with the Jewish community. Joining him in this conversation will be journalist Stephen Roberts, who is with us this evening right here in the front row. And that it's no coincidence that his name is Roberts. And on Tuesday, May 12th at 7 p.m., we'll welcome Pulitzer Prize-winning historian Joseph J. Ellis, who will discuss his new book, The Quartet, Orchestrating the Second American Revolution. The book tells the story of the four men most responsible for creating the US Constitution and the Bill of Rights. If you want to know more about these and all of our upcoming public programs, consult our monthly calendar of events. There are copies of the calendar in the lobby, as well as sign-up sheets where you can receive them by regular mail or email. Cokie Roberts is a familiar name around Washington. She's not just because she's married to Steve Roberts. She's a political commentator for ABC News, where she previously co-anchored the ABC Sunday Morning Show this week. She's also contributed to NPR Morning Edition, where she once was congressional correspondent. She's written three books about the role of women in American history, all of which were bestsellers. She's been active in the National Archives, in projects at the National Archives for a number of years, 
and is vice president of the National Archives Foundation. For her book, Capital Dames, The Civil War and the Women of Washington, she looked at the experiences, influence, and contributions of women of Washington, D.C. during this momentous period of American history. Koki drew upon newspaper articles, government records, and private letters and diaries, many never before published, to bring the war-torn capital into focus through the lives of these capital dames. The result is a look at the impact of the Civil War from a very different perspective. Kirkus Reviews calls Capital Dames an enlightening account detailing how the Civil War changed the nation's capital while expanding the role of women in politics, health care, education, and social services. And the Washington Post observed Roberts has uncovered hundreds of personal anecdotes and woven them together in a single suspenseful narrative with great skill. Joining Koki and discussing her new book is presidential historian Michael Beschlosch. He is a commentator for NBC News and the PBS NewsHour, as well as a best-selling author and contributing columnist for the New York Times. He's also the author of nine best-selling books, most of them about John F. Kennedy, Lyndon B. Johnson, and other presidents. And he, too, is a vice president of the National Archives Foundation. Now it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage Koki Roberts and Michael Bessalow. Thanks, David. Can everyone hear OK? I guess if you can't, you can't reply. Uh, <laughs> back, back row? OK. He's Michael. I'm Koki. That's right. Uh, <laughs> last we checked. Uh, thank you very much, David. Uh, and I guess the, the theme tonight, at least the starting theme, is that we were both vice presidents of the National Archives Which Foundation. Which means we don't do the work. Uh, Amelia Bundles does the work. She's the she president. She sure does, who is the president. <laughs> and, at least my attitude toward Alelia uh, Koki is much more august, is that I feel that uh, I sort of like what, as Koki knows, uh, Eugene McCarthy once said about Hubert Humphrey that he had the soul of a vice president. <laughs> I, I have a soul of vice president. I offer to park cars right, and right. help Alelia. And uh, Koki is in a much more eminent position than that, yeah. and only one of many reasons why we're so thrilled to have her tonight. David has done such a wonderful job of introducing her. It's a little bit like uh, the first Kennedy-Nixon de debate. Howard K. Smith said, the candidates need no introduction. Then he went on to introduce right. both of them. <laughs> uh, which, uh, thanks to David, uh, Koki really <laughs> needs no introduction tonight. All I can say is that she is one of my favorite people on the planet, one of my favorite authors on the planet. You, and one thing I sort of missed, I, I got to be sort of Koki was at, at, in a grand, as she is now, position at ABC News. I was there as a spear carrier years ago. And one of the perks of that job was, uh, as she will confirm, we got to sit together, for instance, on State nights the like Union. the State of the Union, right. President's uh, inaugural address. Right. And usually, you know, no one talks during those. So we had a good time. Well, we had a good time <laughs> only because I got to hear what Koki really thought, you know, during the address, sort of commenting on it line by line. You have to be careful with the microphone. Right. It, it was sort of like the director's <laughs> cut. You know, you could, hear the, you could hear her voice along with the voice of the president. And um, I was getting the history from Michael, so it was uh, perfect. Well, I brought in a few dead people. <laughs> But in any case, I miss those days, and thank you for inviting me tonight. Oh, thank you for coming tonight and doing this. It's very kind of you. Well, one of the things I've loved watching with Koki the last number of years is that she not only has continued as a great journalist, but also has now become a great historian. And I know a little bit of this, but probably many people here don't. You know, how did you get, originally get the instinct to begin turning from not just doing journalism, but also doing history? Well, dead people, as you know, don't talk back. <laughs> and um, that's a great advantage. Um, but well, the um, first, first law for every biographer. Which, uh, I, I'm going to do a more politically cor correct version, <laughs> but it really get rid of the widow or widower. Right, yeah, right. There you go. Well, even the widows, widowers, all of them are gone, too. Right, so right. It's, it's good. Um, well, as many of you know, I see some old friends here. Um, my mother, Lindy Boggs, uh, was very involved uh, in politics, behind the scenes, in theory, um, for many decades. And uh, I saw, growing up here, uh, 
uh, her and her cronies uh, running everything. You know, they, they ran the political conventions, the voter registration drives, their husband's campaigns, their, um, uh, of course, us kids, and, um, and, and along with the African-American women in Washington, all the social service agencies. And so um, I knew how incredibly influential they were. And of course, uh, for somebody who covers politics in Congress, as long as I have, at least, David, thank you for not doing that 40 years in broadcasting thing. <laughs> but, um, but the, she, she started in the cradle. <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, you get, as you well know, to know the founding fathers very well, you know, by first name. And, um, and members of the, the Senate, um, particularly, but you know, all politicians, are always quoting the founding fathers, and 99.9% .9 of the time they're wrong. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, you know, I go back and read them regularly on you know, the right to bear arms, the religion in the public square, why you have to be born in America. It turns out you don't have to be born in America. You just have to be born of American parents to be president. You can be born in <clears throat> Canada, for instance. Um, but they, <laughs> But at any rate, I, so I got to know them quite well and started wondering what the women of the time were doing because I, clearly they must have been at least as influential as the women of my mother's time. And uh, when I went back to learn about them, very little had been written. And so in order to learn about them, I had to research them. And then once I had done that, I might as well write about them. And so I started writing um, those books and then just became completely devoted to it. Uh, Steve is sweet enough to call it my mission, which makes him nice, um, because um, I'm not exactly charming uh, when I'm on deadline, and um, or Excuse lovely. I, I wouldn't know what that's like. <laughs> and so, and, um, but he does understand that it is, it is essentially a mission to bring these women uh, to life and to make their roles known to people, and also um, not just, I mean, the women's history is particularly important to me, but history is important to me, and, and we do such a bad job of teaching it, by and large, uh, that to make it interesting and fun um, seems to me to make all the sense in the world, because it's gossip, you know, history's gossip, and, uh, and gossip's fun, and um, so the notion that we are all supposed to be sitting around memorizing dates and, and battles is just silly. Why did historians leave out women for the first two and a half centuries that American history was <laughs> you written? You tell or me. So? <laughs> well, well. Um, because they didn't think they were important. Right. Um, and uh, and did, it, did it just not turn up in the letters? It the didn't turn up. Or? It's very hard to find the letters. Um, the letters are buried in the men's papers. Most of them have never been transcribed. Um, that's one of the, the amazing things about her books is that she pulls out these things that you would think, you know, they, these were famous people, right. famous wives so long ago, and oftentimes the first time. Well, my, my personal favorite along these lines was um, when I was writing Ladies of Liberty, which is the period from the inauguration of John Adams to the inauguration of John Quincy Adams. So um, 1797 to 1825. And in 1820, Louisa Catherine Adams, John Quincy Adams' wife. Uh, she, he was Secretary of State. She is running him for president. She describes it as my vocation to get him elected president. And, um, and Abigail Adams had died, and she was writing these chatty, wonderful letters home to uh, old John Adams just to amuse him. And so it was 1820. I'm, I'm downstairs in the basement grandchildren's playroom because I could spread out a lot of books there and I'm reading these letters that the Massachusetts Historical Society have been kind enough to send me. At that point they were just Xeroxing them and sending them. Now they'll scan them. But, um, and, um, and I've got this stack of handwritten Xeroxed 18th century, 19th, early 19th century letters. Really hard to read. And um, I start reading this letter and I can't believe it because at, it was the year of the Missouri Compromise, 1820. And because of the compromise, Congress had stayed in session a very long time to hammer out the compromise. And so um, she goes, they finally adjourn. She goes to a meeting of the trustees of the orphan asylum 
which Dolly Madison had established after the British invasion. And so she gets there, and one of the other trustees says to her, we're going to need a new building next year. And she says, why? What are you talking about? And the woman says to her, well, the session had been very long. And the fathers, underlined by Louisa, the fathers of the country had left 40 cases behind that would probably require our institution to serve this illicit progeny. <laughs> 40 pregnant women left behind by the Congress. And, um, and, and there were only a couple hundred members of Congress. And um, I mean, some of them might have been recidivists. I don't know. But I went, I went running upstairs to Steve and I said, read this, read this. And he said, oh my goodness. You know, I mean, but then she said to Adam, she said, I, uh, I suggest, suggest in the next session that they should take the Congress should take the two dollars additional a day that they have voted themselves as an increase in pay, and use it for the establishment of an institution for these foundlings. So, um, I mean, it doesn't get better than that. But the um, but the truth is that those kinds of letters, which tell you a great deal more than just the dates and the battles um, and the elections. Um, are just hidden. They're just in there. They just haven't been, haven't been published. Haven't been transcribed and published. Now her letters are being published, but, but for a very long time they were just stuck in his letters. And with this book, the same is true of her daughter-in-law. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think people like us who are writing about these people of our own period now, what are they going to do 50 years from now without those kind of letters? Yeah. What do you think? I mean, it's a problem, obviously. Um, I, I, for a while, I was feeling pretty good about the fact that emails, even though they're not beautifully written and all of that, do actually tell a family story. Somebody's going off to college. Somebody's getting married. Somebody's sick. Somebody's dying. They're in there, and if you, if you print them out and keep them, you can actually tell a story. But now it's Instagram and all that. Now I suspect, I suspect if you're subpoenaed you can get it out of the cloud. Um, but, um, but it is a problem. I mean, it is going to be hard. And even an email, I mean, you know, these letters that you have used in these books, you know, some of them, what's the longest letter that you've found? Oh, some of them are many pages you know, long. Sometimes 30 pages long. I know, but uh, you know, Steve and I wrote a book on marriage a while back, and I quoted a woman who was a, in a pioneer marriage, and, and she had move west in the early 19th century. Maybe you should explain pioneer marriage. It may not sound to some like what you're... Oh, she was a pioneer in the and west. <laughs> I see what you this mean. This is not some kinky... No, uh, right, okay. Uh, <laughs> Never occurred to me, of course. Nice Catholic girl that right. I am. Uh, but no, the, um, no one here but our viewers on YouTube. <laughs> so she wrote one day in her, in her diary, she said, was up at five, uh, baked nine loaves of bread, taught the, in, the Indian children, was delivered of a son. And, um, and I, I think that's a tweet. Mm -hmm. you know, so, um, <laughs> so you can still get a lot of information. Uh, you know. I think that, that probably is a little bit reassuring. <laughs> and what other, tell a little bit more about the other things that you use aside from letters. Because well, you've really um, gone into, for instance, one thing that I think people forget is that now, as you write about in the book, we can search old newspapers. Which is so I mean, much it used fun. to be when we all started out, you know, you'd have to go to the li Library of Congress right. and you'd have to have to, uh, but now you can actually no, quite it's, quickly. It's tell one them. of the great advantages to writing history now as opposed to earlier. Newspapers are online. Yeah. Um, the Library of Congress has a wonderful site uh, funded by the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities uh, called Chronicling America. And it's newspapers from the late 18th century on. And uh, you know, you put in a search of somebody's name or a date, and up comes the story. There's a, and it's free. There's a paid one called newspapers.com, uh, which also is very helpful. And these are newspapers from all over the country. Now, a lot of the same stories appeared in newspapers. There was right. no copyright. Nobody, nobody, you know, and said. And once the telegraph started. And so it would be the same story uh, over and over. It never again. happens now. No, no, certainly not. Um, but um, and uh, then the New York Times entire archive is online, and so it's really 
it's a wonderful resource because first of all, you're reading what they were reading, you know, so you're in real time. Secondly, much to my surprise, these women were written about, you know. I mean, even when I was growing up, the rule was for a nice lady, you were only in the paper when you were born, married, and died. And, um, and these women were in the newspapers, and so that was very interesting. But the third thing is the newspapers are so much fun that you can waste so much time reading them, you know, because all the ads are there, all of exactly. that, and it's, exactly. it's a lot of fun. And you oftentimes spend many hours getting off on things many. that have nothing Way to do with your many. book. Right, right. Sometimes happens in presidential libraries, too, <laughs> that you see files that were not directly related to what you were thinking about. Uh, so, obviously, letters and those kind of sources. One thing I've always thought was a huge strength of you as an historian is that you have spent so much of your life here in Washington. You did not obviously live through any of these periods, but to Almost. some extent, <laughs> you, know, you, you did you know, through in your mind and, and experiencing the sources and thinking and writing about them, but do you find that it is helpful yes. to have grown up in a famous American so. political family and have had, talk about that. Yes, one. very much so. Um, I realized as I was writing uh, the earlier books that one of the things that I could bring to the history was the, um, the Washington experience. And so that um, I understood the politics of the history better than some other historians that I've read. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, when I was uh, contemplating this book, um, I actually had never intended to write a Civil War book. Um, my, all, of, all of my ancestors fought on the losing side, and um, <laughs> and uh, and it's it's such an awful war, you know. But the um, but the publisher very much wanted a civil war book, and and I'm glad I've done it. But as I was trying to figure out what the book would be, which was hard, uh, I I knew it would be about women, but what, you know? And so as I thought about it, um, I realized that maybe the Civil War, because it was likely, had had an impact on women's roles that was similar to World War II. Mm -hmm. And it turned out it didn't. And that's basically the thesis of the book, that it, it uh, changed women's roles and it changed the role of Washington in American society. But um, again, if you start to talk about changing women's roles, you can't just do the country. You know, it's way too diffuse. So to focus on Washington, uh, then became the most sensible thing to do. But I also feel strongly that it's the, it's a place where I can bring a certain strength. And uh, that just, just understanding what's going on politically even 150 years ago is, is still something that I just get because I get the conversation. You know? And don't you wonder, like when you go down a, a street in Washington, wonder what it looked like yes. 150 years ago? Yes, and that's ago. what's a lot of fun. For those of you who you know who live here, this is this book's a lot of fun that way because you'll say, "Oh, third and C," you know. <laughs> the scenes and, you will know. Right. right. So that that Sounds. was a lot of fun. Yeah. And if you're describing the period 1948 to 19, excuse me, 1848 to. I began in 48 uh, for a specific reason, which was that it was the dedication of the Washington Monument. Yeah, an amazing. And family. and. Uh, it took a long time for it to get built, right. but um, and <laughs> the end of the book, it's still the Washington Monument at 153 feet, you know, but a Matthew Brady picture. But, um, um, th and the reason for that was that that was a moment that harked back to the founding because Dolly Madison and Eliza Hamilton were there. Yeah, amazing. And it is, and, and Louisa Catherine Adams actually, uh, had been on the committee, but she was up in Boston and wasn't there for it. So, um, so these women were really a connection, a very living connection to the founders. And so uh, they represented a, a sense of unity, particularly Dolly Madison, who was such a force in the city. I mean, she really was first lady for about a half a century. And um, no, seriously, because of a variety of reasons they were sort of lame first ladies. And um, no, I don't mean it quite that badly, but it's true. And, um, and, so she, and she was such a presence that everybody went to her and, and call, called on her, but also uh, sought her advice. And so, uh, so she 
being there, presiding with Eliza Hamilton, really did uh, remind people of why the country was founded and that it had been a unified country fighting the British at a time when the country was beginning to fall apart after the Mexican War, where the addition of all the new territories had the Congress uh, saw its points over what to do in those territories. So that's why it began there. And, uh, and then she died. Dolly died the next year. And the women of Washington started vying for Chief Bell. And they called themselves Bells, which I love. Um, and one of them, a wonderful, a delightful woman named Virginia Clay, who was the wife of an Alabama congressman, senator, um, wrote a book later in life. When she was 75, she wrote a memoir called About Herself, called A Bell of the 50s. So um, she, she knew you know, what her stature was. Um, but so, the, so their whole interplay among each other uh, in that period in the, of the, really the decade of the 1850s is really very Cause fascinating. Because it, it's really a group biography. Yes, it as is. As well as being great yes. history. Uh, my favorite in the book is Verena Davis. She's quite and something. Can we start with her and tell her story? Verena Davis is the wife of Jefferson Davis. Um, and he was a difficult person. That's a nice statement. And, um, I and say, she, yeah, you're, you're starting really yeah, mild tonight. Yeah. But. She, um, she married him as a teenager, you know, which that's the other thing you have to remember about these women. They were so young. And uh, he was in the Senate. She came to Washington as a Senate wife, as a teenager. Uh, lived in a boarding house, which was by far the easiest thing to do. Um, then he, they, he goes back home, uh, is back in Mississippi for a while. Then she oh, well, fights in the Mexican War. She then, he comes back as um, President Pierce's Secretary of War. And now she's a cabinet wife, right? And they have a couple of little kids. And uh, she really was the foremost hostess in Washington because Pierce's wife, was in mourning through the entire presidency. She, she, she had already lost two children, and on her way to Washington to become first lady, she sees her only remaining child killed by a train. And so she was just in mourning, and, and the descriptions are just all that death's head in the White House, you know, like that. But um, so Verena Davis took on the role, and um, she was loved by everybody. She was smart, she was funny, but she was incredibly frank. And her letters are just grand to read because she's so frank. And so after the 1856 election, by now Davis is back in the Senate, uh, one, of the, one of the women who they all loved and, and admired, who was still a teenager at this point, was Adele Cutts. And she was right in the running for Chief Bell even though she did not have a powerful man in her life. But her great aunt was Dolly Madison. And um, so after the, that election, she married Stephen Douglas, the senator from Illinois. And Verena Davis was furious. And she says, you know, this, this well-bred young woman marries this trickster, drunken, you know, uh, man who's, who's got his first wife's money. And, uh, and she said, and it's just happening because she is poor and her father is proud. And then she says, but fortunately, there's a new water system coming to Washington, so perhaps Douglas will wash more often. <laughs> <laughs> Because otherwise, he will offend her all factories. And, <laughs> and, um, and, and people will have to build larger rooms with more ventilation. <laughs> so, you know, you've got to love that. And, um, and, and on she goes. You know, she's, she and, and her husband are always having a somewhat tense relationship. But he, he clearly admires her. You know, that comes through. Although in this relationship, he certainly is True. not the compelling figure. No, he's, no, he's not anybody you'd want to hang out with. And she's, um, <laughs> and she, um, she's always kind of uh, chafing against the little wife. And um, she becomes very close friends with the Blairs here, the Blair House Blairs. And uh, at one point, they arrange that, that the Davises can rent a house near them in Oakland. Maryland, and she and and Jefferson Davis writes to his mother-in-law and says, uh, she's she's gotten the house at a good rate, 
what they're going to pay me to hang out with the Blairs, I don't know. You know <laughs> but, um, but then, you know, she goes through the Civil War. She loses a child just like Mary Lincoln. She lost a child here in a childhood disease. And then in Richmond, her 10-year-old falls off the building and dies. So it was very similar to Mary Lincoln in a lot of ways. And similar to Mary Lincoln, she was uh, suspect by the South, just the way Mary was by the North. Um, her grandfather, Verena's grandfather, had been the governor of New Jersey. And so that was, you know, suspect. She had gone to school. To be governor of New Jersey. Right, because she was, New Jersey was North. Right. And, um, and she had gone to school in Philadelphia. But also she was somewhat olive complected. And she was not fair enough for a true Southern bill. And, uh, and she got heat about that. Finally, the war is over. She, Jefferson Davis is in prison. She gets him out. Um, they have a troubled time. They're separated at times, finally together. Finally, he dies. Phew. And, um, <laughs> and <laughs> this is the author speaking. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she moves to New York. And the South goes crazy. You know, the first lady of the Confederacy moving to New York. This is horrible. They, they offer her a house in Richmond. She says, no, I'm going to New York. It's where I can make a living. She needed to make a living. She was writing for the New York World newspaper. But she wrote to her daughter with all this. I mean, the newspapers were all writing about how terrible it was. She wrote to her daughter, and she said, I am free, brown, and 64. I can do whatever I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> so. She then did move to New York, and she did write for the newspaper, but she also ran a salon. Anybody who knew her always talked about what a wonderful conversationalist she was. But she befriended Julia Grant, the wife of Ulysses S. Grant, and that turned out to be page one news in all of the newspapers when the two of them met. And they, both of them, but particularly Verena Davis, because Julia Grant's really nice, but not the brightest bulb. And she, um, <laughs> They, but they understood that what they were doing was affecting reconciliation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and she went very purposefully to the dedication of the Grant Memorial, Verena Davis did, mm -hmm. um, so that the world would see the First Lady of the Confederacy going to the dedication of the Union Generals and President's uh, Memorial. And, uh, and there was a lot of that after the war among these women, of them trying to bring the country back and together. And knowing that, that, that they had an important role. That they had a role to play when everybody else was in the South was still you know, weeping about the lost cause. Right. You show us a different Mary Todd Lincoln. Talk a little bit about that. Well, it's hard to, you know, Mary Todd Lincoln. Um, she's, she's hard, you know. There's, I mean, didn't you try to write about Mary Todd Lincoln and get oh, very yeah, depressed yeah, at yeah, some point? Yeah. Yes, I saw it. It's not, not, not an irrational response. <laughs> so um, she is bipolar, I guess, would be the modern uh, diagnosis. Clearly, it's a love affair between the Lincolns. That's clearly the case. And she's smart, and, she's, um, and she understands him in all kinds of ways, but she's really difficult. And, um, and she has a temper, and she has, um, she has views, and she expresses them. And so people don't like that, because she says what she thinks about cabinet members who she doesn't like, and all of that. Which, which is wonderful for the historian. It is. It's wonderful that she said all that, yes. Um, but you know, again, so she was accused of leaking the President's State of the Union message uh, to the New York Herald on the theory for money. The th well, either yeah. for money or for good coverage, because yeah. her coverage was bad. Uh, every time she'd go to New York, the entire press corps would land on her and watch everything she bought, which was a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were all over her. I mean, it, look, it looks like you know some other first lady that we've seen recently. And, um, <laughs> and she, um, she was accused of leaking the State of the Union message. And there was a congressional investigation into the first lady's communication, and, uh, and the president had to go up to the Hill and say, please don't do this. You know, don't embarrass me by, by subpoenaing the First Lady. And uh, so a lot of things don't change. Do you, think, do you think she had as large a sense of her role as Verena D Davis did after the war? No, after the war, mm -hmm. she was a mess. Yeah. Um, she, 
you know, she stayed in the White House for a few months after Lincoln was killed. Now she was sitting next to him in the theater we were talking about earlier, and that would be that would be a shock of major proportions for someone who was fragile to, to begin with. with. And and in fact, um, when her half sister came, uh, this was one of these odd moments where her half sister's husband was a Confederate officer who had been killed in the war, and she came and stayed at the White House. So there's a Confederate widow in the Lincoln White House. And um, that woman's daughter wrote a book about Mary Lincoln, quoting her mother's diary from that period. And uh, Emily Helm was her name. And, um, and in, her, in the diary, um, Mrs. Helm was talking about how uh, how mentally off balance Mary Lincoln was, and that President Lincoln even said that to her, mm -hmm. and and took her to the window. And well, that was, but that was, was Elizabeth Keckley telling um, us that who no, we should talk about. But no, that's my but, next the, uh, but the but but uh, Emily Helm said that the President said, you know, how how worried he was about her mental state, and and she herself judged uh, the, the half sister if anything happens to him, meaning. Abraham or Tad, uh, she will she will go off the deep end, and of course it did. Both, yeah, indeed. Tell I was going to ask later, but we've gotten to Elizabeth Keckley, so tell us who she was. Well, Elizabeth Keckley was one of the most interesting people you'd ever want to yeah, read about. Um, she was a slave who bought her freedom. Uh, at the time when she bought her freedom, she was in St. Louis. She was she moved to Baltimore. Um, to try to teach African American women uh, to sew and to have make a living, that didn't work out for her. So she moved here, and she was a highly, highly accomplished dressmaker, a couturier, and um, she started sewing for Verena Davis and Elizabeth Blair Lee and all of the prominent women. And uh, and then when Mary uh, Lincoln moved to town, she wanted to hire the best, and so uh, Elizabeth Keckley started sewing for her, and they became confidants. Uh, really, really, Mrs. Keckley was really Mrs. Lincoln's best friend. And, um, and she took care of Willie when he was sick, and then after he and then dealt with him after his body after he died. She took care of Mrs. Lincoln after the president was killed, went to Illinois with her, all of that, and then wrote a tell-all. And um, just again, things don't change, right. you know. And uh, <laughs> and so, uh, and that book ruptured the relationship uh, with Mary Lincoln completely. But uh, and it also really pretty much ruined Mrs. Keckley's business because um, the people she sewed for were worried she might write about them, and um, and the African Americans thought she had betrayed Lincoln, and so she had trouble keeping her business going. She did teach for a while at Wilberforce University, but her big mission in life was to help um, the freed slaves. Um, and it started when uh, enslaved people started showing up here before the emancipation. Um, and she started a contraband society. And because she had such influential patrons, uh, she was able to raise a good deal of money and get their, their support. And so she was really able to help enormously the thousands of enslaved people arriving in Washington. And then after emancipation, it became a Freedmen's Society. And so she was a real social reformer as well. And, and a much larger figure than right. people knew for most of the Right. And the, and the truth is, she's, it's interesting, of the women I write about, because she was black, she's the only, she was barely black, she was about my color. But um, she was um, she was the only one who I could not find an obituary for. Isn't that something? Yeah. Incredible. Uh, Clara Barton is another example of someone we thought we knew, but when you read Cokie's book, I think you'll feel that you don't. Yeah. Well, you know, this is one of the things that drives me crazy about history books. You know, it's kind of. And then she founded the Red Cross. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> really, was it hard? <laughs> you know. <laughs> Did something go before that? You know, um, but she was she was raised uh, in a New England family with a mother who was a suffragist and an abolitionist, and 
uh, she, uh, she taught, and she was always railing against the fact that uh, she often made less than men. So she was aware of that and talking about it in the 1840s. And then she came to Washington to make a living. She worked at the patent office. And when the war started, uh, the Massachusetts uh, troops started arriving. And so she started helping them out. And then some of them had been people she had taught. And, she, and they wrote home and said, there's this great woman here who's you know, collecting supplies for us. So everybody started sending her stuff for the troops. She ended up with three warehouses full of uh, supplies. And so she went to the quartermaster general and said, you know, I can help. I've got three warehouses full. So he gave her permission to go to the front. And, um, and she then started nursing, bringing supplies constantly, but also nursing uh, in some of the worst battles uh, that were fought, um, particularly Antietam, where she was on the field uh, for days and just, you know, um, uh, do, seeing horrendous things. But uh, was very well respected for it. And then uh, when the war was over, she, she started the Missing Persons Bureau and, um, and really was the person who was able to find um, the people who couldn't be found. She, put, she would go to regiments and have put uh, ads in newspapers of their towns, and then people would write to her from those newspapers about, uh, I saw him in X place, that kind of thing. Uh, the archives was very helpful in, in uh, some of Clara Barton's um, uh, documents. But then uh, she went to Europe, and she also marked tens of thousands of graves um, that had been unmarked graves, particularly at Andersonville, the horrendous Confederate prison. Um, but then after the war, she went to Europe and discovered something called the Red Cross and came home and, um, and established the American Red Cross. But in order to uh, uh, unite with the International Red Cross, the United States had to ratify the Geneva Conventions, the same Geneva Conventions we're talking about today. And uh, she worked for two decades lobbying the Congress until they finally did ratify the conventions. And then she got inserted into them what was called the American Amendment which says that the Red Cross can go to natural disasters as well as onto battlefields. So that's how that all happened. Okay. So, so when you read about a flood someplace where the Red Cross is there, that's all her doing. Mm -hmm. you, you were mentioning Julia Grant, who President Lincoln was assassinated 150 years ago. Last week. Last week. She had a role in that evening mention what that was and talk a little bit more about her. Well, she had been invited to the theater. The Grants had been invited to the theater to sit in the box with the Lincolns. But uh, she had, Mrs. Grant had reason not to like Mrs. Lincoln. Uh, Mrs. Lincoln kept giving people reasons not to like her. And, um, and how many people declined the invitation? Oh, I mean, I, there's just, I mean, the number of people they asked to go to the theater with them was huge. And I mean, they finally ended up with this, you know, couple that was they just barely knew. Barely we knew and right, yeah. exactly. Will you please come with us, you know? And so, um, but, uh, but Julia Grant had been down at the Union um, headquarters at City Point, the port outside of Richmond. And, um, and Mary Lincoln had come down to visit with the president, come down to visit the troops, and had been just incredibly rude to Julia Grant, just, just viciously rude. And, um, and what was it that bothered her most? Well, what always bothered Mary Lincoln was that she thought that another woman uh, was uh, got the president's about. eye, or was sitting next to the president on a horse, or you know, and <laughs> I mean, in this case, it was a horse, uh, and and she and Mrs. Grant had taken an ambulance to the um, parade grounds where they were going to see the troops marching in review. And when she got there, one of the general's wives was on a horse next to the president, and she just had a fit, and she had a fit with the the woman, she had a fit with the president, she had a fit with Mrs. Grant, she just had a total fit. And, um, and then when she came back, uh, when after Richmond was uh, uh, liberated or whatever you fell, um, 
She didn't invite Mrs. Grant to join her when she went into Richmond. And then she had a party, and they were on boats next to each other in the river, in the James River. And she didn't invite Mrs. Grant to the party. Mrs. Grant uh, then had the Marine Band come on her ship and drove and had to go up and down by <laughs> Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Lincoln's and, and play You'll Miss Me When I'm Gone or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, and this we all know from Mrs. Grant's writings. Right, and, right. and her book, by the way, she wrote this book of memoirs, which she could not find a publisher for. It was not published until 1975. Mm -hmm. Julia Grant, because nobody thought she was important. It's an example of just exactly, she was about and it's a delightful book. But at any rate, um, she tells in the book, Mary Lincoln summons them to the theater, and she says to her husband, "I'm not going. We're going home because she hadn't seen her children in months, and uh, they were at school in New Jersey." And she said, "We're going home to see the children." And Grant said, well, maybe later. She said, no, 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 we're actually going home to see the children. <laughs> and she was clear that she was very insistent on it. And, um, but then she, she had a whole sort of series of events during the day that were quite peculiar. And she came to um, believe quite strongly that this was the assassin assigned to Grant, who was supposed because Grant was supposed to be assassinated sure. as well. And, um, and that they had dodged, literally dodged the bullet by going home to the children. Uh, we mentioned Elizabeth Blair Lee in passing, but let's hear a little bit more. Well, she's the Blair of Blair House uh, here in Washington, of course, we all know. Her father, Francis Preston Blair, had been originally a confidant of Andrew Jackson and a newspaper man in the Jackson administration. In fact, she was such a favorite of uh, President Jackson's that he gave her his wife Rachel's wedding ring. And she, she and Jesse... Benton at the time, uh, Thomas Hart Benton's daughter, really grew up together in the Jackson White House. The, the same was they grew up in caucus. And, um, and then her, when Lincoln's president, her father is a confidant of, of the president. Her brother, is, Montgomery Blair, is in the cabinet. Her other brother, Frank Blair, is in the Congress from Missouri. And uh, her husband, Phillips Lee, who was Robert E. Lee's cousin, was in the Union Navy. And because he was in the Navy, she wrote to him pretty much every day. And uh, so there are thousands of letters, uh, hundreds of which have been published. The wartime letters have been published. But the rest are, are at Princeton and, and findable. And, um, and she writes this such an interesting description of everything that's going on in Washington. She's politically very involved and astute. But she's also a, a good reporter. And so she's telling us, because one of the things that really I had not thought about or understood was what incredible danger the city was in, particularly at the beginning of the war. Sure. I mean, there was Virginia right across the river, and Maryland was iffy about whether it would secede or not. And and dangers e on Lincoln's inaugural. Right, day. all of that. And even after Maryland stayed in the Union, there were plenty of Confederate sympathizers. and so. Uh, it was it was dicey until a series of forts were built around the city. And even then, there were a couple of times when both she and a couple of other women wrote, you know, if the Confederates decide to come in, nobody's going to stop them because the, the Union Army was all elsewhere. Um, so she gives a very strong sense of that and a couple of times did have to leave for safety. Um, but she also uh, does, she really does a play-by-play. And, uh, and so you get a very good sense of what's happening, both uh, in terms of the war and politically. And there are moments, you know, what's wonderful about these letters, first of all, women's letters are just better. Um, <laughs> I mean, they just are. You know, men's letters, uh, particularly famous men, they think about them, they edit them, they, they think they're going to be published, they're pompous. Um, and, the women's letters are just frank and funny and fresh and, and, and alive. And, um, and also the details that just so get your attention. And um, in one of her letters, she talks about um, a, a young man who they buried that day. He had been killed in the war. And she said, and today was supposed to be his wedding day. 
And you just get, you know, goosebumps thinking about it. And uh, those kinds of details really tell you a great deal. She was also, for 50 years, a director of the orphan asylum, which is still here. Hillcrest uh, is the orphan asylum that Dolly Madison founded in 1814. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's amazing. I'm going to ask one or two questions, but anyone from the audience who has a question for Koki in about three or four minutes, uh, I will mention when the time comes, but please keep what you would like to ask in mind. And when the time comes, please come up to either microphone on either side. I do want to just tell you about one more set of letters, which was Abigail Brooks Adams. And these letters have never been published either. And she was Charles Francis Adams' wife, so John Quincy's son. Um, and he was in Congress for one term. Uh, but it was the notorious 36th Congress right. that seceded from the Union. And you then, had to have someone there for the term. Right. Been... And he, that's right. Oh, yeah. And he then went on to uh, London to be the Union ambassador to the court of St. James and was highly instrumental in keeping uh, the British from uh, allying with the Confederacy. But she was right in the tradition of her mother-in-law and grandmother-in-law of being a very frank um, woman with strong views. And her letters were home to Henry Adams, her son. And, um, and she writes, Buchanan is a toad. And, uh, and, and she also wrote, the Senate is acting like children and silly ones at that. <laughs> I mean, you can totally get behind that. And, um, <laughs> But my favorite was that she said, uh, I would advise any woman, any young woman, who wants to have a quiet, peaceful life not to marry an Adams. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since, since you mentioned Buchanan, this is the, the last name I'll ask about, Harriet Lane. Well, Harriet Lane was James Buchanan's niece. Uh, she was orphaned when she was about 11 years old and asked to live with her uncle, James Buchanan. And so he raised her. Um, she came here to visitation. And a lot of these women went to visitation. It, um, it educated women of all faiths and from both, uh, both North and South. And actually, remarkably, uh, Southern women stayed there during the war, uh, unlike at Georgetown, for instance. Um, her, and and, the, and the, uh, the Union never took over the school uh, which they did pretty much every school and every church and every hotel for either barracks or hospitals. But they didn't take over visitation because um, Winfield Scott daughter had become a, a nun and was buried there. And he, he still had enough clout to say, you're not taking my daughter to school. And so um, she went to visitation as a girl. And, um, and, then, and he was at that point um, Secretary of State and her uncle, and she would come into this, she would leave the boarding school and come uh, be with him on Sundays and learn a lot about politics and all of that. And then he became ambassador uh, to the court of St. James, and she went with him to London, and she was highly uh, regarded, mainly by Queen Victoria, who named her an honorary ambassadress, and, um, and her friends kept advising her to marry in England uh, because she was going to come home and not find somebody here. And that actually turned out to be pretty much true. Yeah. And um, good, so she came point. back, and she was the first lady in uh, the Buchanan administration. And it, she's the first person uh, for whom the term first lady was applied in the press. Um, so that was, and she was, it was not a wife. It was not a wife. Yeah. And she was, she was uh, pretty well regarded by most of the women here. Some of them thought she was a little too cold and proper. Um, it's a criticism you never hear about right. any she, first lady. She just wasn't fun. Mm -hmm. um, but she did everything she was supposed to do. And then during the war, she, um, she had a miserable time because Buchanan was so appropriately vilified. And um, then she late, late in life, or late for the time, married. Uh, a man from Baltimore, and moved there and became very interested in poor children in Baltimore. She had two boys. They died in successive years as teenagers, and then her husband died. And she established a hospital for 
uh, Poor Children in Baltimore, which is now the Harriet Lane Children's Clinic of Johns Hopkins University. And then she moved here back to Washington where she had really been happiest. And, um, and when uh, Theodore Roosevelt became president, she did a lot of the entertaining at the White House. He called on her to do that. But she also had said the whole time she had been in the White House as First Lady, she had been lobbying for, and these women lobbied constantly, and she had been lobbying for a National Gallery of Art and, uh, and helped establish kind of a, 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 a lobbying group, you know, an association that would uh, try to get a National Gallery of Art. She did not succeed in her life, but she left her art collection to the Smithsonian, which determined that in its charter uh, an art gallery was called for. So the National Gallery of Art really did start as a result of Harriet Lane. Mm -hmm. Wonderful bequest. Uh, last two quick questions then before we go to the audience. Uh, of the women, and the, these are very strong women, and in the course of what they were doing, in many cases you can see them expanding opportunities right. for women, particularly in professional life, but of all the women that you've got in this book, who do you think consciously said to herself, that's part of my mission, I think that women are underused and should have a different role in American life? You know, they didn't really think that way. Uh -huh. um, Clara Barton, more than anybody, would have thought that way, but she couldn't get along with other women well. Uh, so she, she thought it in theory, but she didn't do it in practice. Um, uh, it really just wasn't in their consciousness as, as something that they wrote about or talked about. But after the war, what you did start to see was that they had they became suffragist mm -hmm. and um, and almost naturally um, exactly that they had seen what the war had wrought and they felt strongly that they needed to be involved and and that women needed to have much more say in government because the men weren't doing a very good job of Wish it. They were. Real, right? so. And final question, uh, the flip side of this, of the men you deal with in the book, which of them is highest on the Cokie Roberts scale of it's knowing a, that women are so smart? It's actually interesting. You know, I've never really liked any of the men. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> you know, I admire Thomas Jefferson and John Adams and George Washington, but I don't like them. Um, I like Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. I really do. And, um, and on this issue, too. And I, did, and I didn't know him until I started writing this book. And I really came away liking him a lot. Mm -hmm. so. Well, on that note, uh, I assume that <laughs> Koki has uh, provoked at least there one or two There are microphones and people. And the only reason we really request that you go to the microphones is because this is the archives. Right. And we keep records. And, right. uh, and so in so order not, to have Not the a, NSA. They don't keep <laughs> records over there. So in order to have a record on tape, we need you to be at the microphones. That's great. Um, as an historian, which woman do you think should be on the $20 bill? You know. <laughs> so as, as I understand it, the, there's like a narrow list from which to choose, and I don't understand who made up the list. Um, I mean, why, why did that happen? Why don't we get to vote? Well, if you could choose without regard um, to any limits. Well, it's hard to say. I, I suppose, I mean, actually my first answer to this question was Dolly Madison, and, and people got very upset because, you know, she's a wife. Um, and um, I thought she, she made a lot of sense, but yeah, um, <laughs> but um, I, I suppose the suffragists would be the women that you know was kind of the I mean the prominent suffragists like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, but of course we have a Susan B. Anthony dollar. It, nobody uses it, you know. <laughs> um, um, but I, you know it's it's you could certainly make a case for. Abigail Adams, um, because of her writings about uh, women and, and rights. Um, uh, Mercy Otis Warren, I mean, there are people you can make a case for. But uh, are they of the stature of uh, Hamilton, Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln? Yes, probably Jackson, that's why the 20 is, <laughs> that's why the 20 is the aim, but, um, 
but um, <laughs> but it is you know it is a problem because women were not allowed to be in those roles. So. Yeah, um, obviously, civil war is. Uh, Hi, John. Yeah, good to see <laughs> you. Um, you know, civil war is a major event in this era. How did the role of women in war differ? in this era than in the other eras you wrote about uh, in your previous books? Well, what interested me was how, it, how similar it was. That was what I was kind of looking for and, and found. Uh, so that, you know, we've now been um, educated, thankfully, partly because of the archives, uh, of, the, of the role of Rosie the Riveter and her sisters um, in World War II, and the government girls who came into Washington in droves to, to um, as the as the bureaucracy expanded to deal with the wars, um, and those those women were there in the Civil War, which which was interesting, very interesting to me. So, we had excuse me, women working in the arsenals, in Rosie the Riveter type jobs, and here in Washington there was a horrendous arsenal explosion, uh, which killed a couple of dozen young young women, and um, and the newspaper accounts are just awful. And uh, they're talking about these charred bodies where you can't recognize them, and that they are trapped in their hoop skirts, um, you know, because they had to dress properly to go stuff cartridges, you know, for, for ammunition. And then government girls arrived by the hundreds. And uh, they arrived mainly to make a living, but they came just as Congress passed um, legislation uh, allowing for the printing of paper money to pay for the war. And, um, and the money then as now, you know, comes off the printing press in these huge sheets. Of course, now it's cut up by machines. Then you sat and cut out each uh, bill with scissors. And the treasurer of the United States, General Skinner, said, women are better with scissors than men are. <laughs> and, um, and so he hired them by the hundreds. He also said you can pay them less, um, something NPR certainly understood. And uh, the um, and so you know that this, those similarities very much interested me. And then uh, seeing the um, the change in attitude uh, among the women who had been the political women uh, before the war who had been very interested in politics and had gone to the Capitol all the time and listened to all the debates and commented on them and uh, helped their husbands with speeches and letters and all of that. After the war, they stood on the stage themselves and, and uh, militated for suffrage or, um, or became journalists uh, or became social service organizers. So they, they, they went from behind the scenes to the scenes. And so I thought that was very similar to World War II. And the suffrage piece was similar to after World War II. That is when you started to get the uh, Equal Rights Amendment piece. That, that was introduced uh, immediately after World War II. So the suffrage part was very uh, correlated, cor correlated with that, I thought. Okay. Last maybe. Yes, I was interested to hear you say <clears throat> that Lincoln is your favorite president. I'm a Southerner with a South Carolina grandmother who refused to hear his name in her presence. I, I'm and one of the Louisiana. reasons why was because <laughs> he made vicious war on women and children deliberately with the idea of breaking the spirit of the South and the women in particular. And that was just not the code of war well, as it I, should have you been. Know, I, I was raised that way too, but it's just not true. Uh, well, please and, expatiate. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I totally was raised with all of that. And also where, where everybody hid the silver. You know, why the Yankees never caught on that the silver was always in those fan windows, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> but I mean, I, I, my, I, I say in the book, my, my great-grandfather, when I go to my mother's grave, there is my great-grandfather's grave. And it says, CSA. Confederate States of America. My, my father's um, un great uncle um, was a general, a Confederate general, who, um, who didn't surrender till six weeks after Appomattox, the, the Army of Trans-Mississippi. And um, so, you know, I, I was raised the way your grandmother raised you, but it's just not true. And, uh, and the truth is, is that the, the war um, fought in the South 
was, first of all, most of it, most of it was in Virginia and to some degree in Pennsylvania. I mean, and then there were the Western uh, fronts, but, um, but the Deep South really didn't have much of the war. South Carolina barely saw the war and, um, until Sherman's army came back up. And then he was bad in South Carolina because South Carolina had been the state to secede. But you know what was the most ravaged city in the war was Richmond, and it was done by the Confederates as they left. Well, they burned it, but that doesn't answer the question why you admire Lincoln. Because sorry, I don't. <laughs> I don't I'm hear sorry, that. I, I, I disagree with your premise that he waged a war against women and children. He he said that he, he didn't say that. Well, we have to disagree with that. <laughs> okay. um, but but in fact, it did happen, as you know. Uh, but I want to know what you admire. <laughs> No, okay, I, I think we've got it. <laughs> My family comes on both sides from Richmond, too. I'm a, I'm a thorough Virginian, except for a little South Carolina. Uh -huh. And I can tell you it was bad. Of course okay. it was bad, but what was really bad But was... why do you admire Lincoln? That because... is the question. <laughs> tell you what, come to the signing, buy 10 books, and then she will tell you why she... <laughs> Thank you very much. I mean, the, from my perspective, the really, really bad thing was the South seceding. The South was a prosperous part of the country that could have, could have eventually figured its way to, um, to freeing the slaves, which had to happen uh, for, for moral reasons as well as economic ones and every kind of reason on earth. And, and instead, they made this dumb decision, which impoverished the South and killed tens of thousands of people. And, the bad part was they were starving in the South because they didn't have the wherewithal to exist without the rest of the country. Um. <laughs> um, you've talked a lot about um, women that have had a, a huge impact or whatever, but maybe one of the characters from D.C. in the Civil War is a little bit more infamous, um, Mary Surratt. What is your sort of opinion on her, and how do you think that her execution maybe changed the way that the city viewed women, or the country? I don't think it. I, I don't think that her execution changed the way people viewed women. It was the first execution of a woman uh, by the federal government, and I think she was innocent. Um, uh, but I, you know, but the. I don't think it had an effect in terms of how people viewed women. She was by far the most, the person who got the most coverage because she was a woman. And people who went to the trial were fascinated by her. Um, and she, um, she, you know, would sort of look straight, she wore a veil, and she would try to look straightforward and all that. And then when she came out to be hanged, um, she was the first one they brought to the gallows. And, and uh, there was a, a tremendous kind of, Fascinating. It was. It was. You know, like celebrity gossip. It was you know, ghoulish. it was ghoulish and interesting to people. Adele Cutts Douglas uh, tried at the last minute to get Andrew Johnson to pardon her. People were amazed that she was that she was hanged, and um, everyone assumed she would not be. And um, and Johnson just absolutely refused. And, and Adele Adele Cutts went right by bayonets to get to Johnson and say, you know, you've got to pardon her, and he just wouldn't hear it. She got a lot of other people pardoned, but she didn't get married to that pardon. Indeed. Anyway, the book is Capital Dames. Uh, thank you, Koki. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all for being here. You've only heard a hundredth of what's in it. Uh, thank you again, Coke. Uh, there's a signing right now outside. Uh, as I said, I re recommend that everyone here buy 10 copies, <laughs> read it 10 times. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Michael.